Everyone, thank you for your patience. Uh, we will be getting started now. Um, my name is Harry Nelson. I'll be introducing myself and everybody else that will be speaking. Thank you for joining us. And hopefully um, we'll be more will be joining us as we get started. And as you're probably aware, you're signing up, we're going to be speaking about the Master of Sustainable Forest Management Program here at the, the University of British Columbia. I guess, Natasha, can you take us to the next slide, please? Just to make sure you've come to the right place. So I am speaking to you from the traditional ancestral and unceded lands and territories of the uh, Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil peoples, or that's at least where UBC is located. Today, I'm actually speaking from Treaty 8, um, country. And many of you are probably yourselves on indigenous lands, uh, depending on where you are. Now, as we get started, um, one of the things that we would like to ask you to do is to give us some information about where you're from. That'll help us think about how we answer some of the questions that you may have. So at some point through this, you'll see uh, a poll that pops up, or if you go click right there on the poll, this just helps us think about understanding where you're from um, and kind of additional background and kind of how we are going to help you answer your questions that you have. And along those lines, I will note that questions, you probably have questions already. Some of these you've submitted. Some of these may come up as we go through the presentation. At the end, we do have time set aside to be able to answer that question. So I would encourage you to listen because some of your questions may get answered as we go through this. And um, if not, we will address them um, when we get to that section of the presentation. So thank you for those that are participating. Um, and we'll keep track of that as we go along. Uh, the next slide, please. So that's me on the left, picture that's far too old. I'm the program director. I am also uh, I teach forest policy and economics in the Faculty of Forestry, and I also teach those courses in the MSFM program. To my right, you have Deb DeLong, who's been with the program for very many years. Um, Deb will also be speaking during this presentation, and Deb has a long and extensive background, both working um, in academia, working in research as an extension forester and working out in the field um, and a passion for doing this. So we will, uh, I'll let Deb introduce herself and get to it. Next up that'll be speaking is Ken Byrne, who's now the program coordinator. I'll let Ken introduce himself. And finally, we have Julie joining us as well that can help answer questions um, and basically is knows everything that there is to know about how to get into the program or what kind of requirements you need to meet. Next slide, please, I guess. Natasha and Fabian, who are helping out, but keeping themselves um, behind the scenes. So here's the agenda for today. We're going to introduce Vancouver, for those of you that aren't familiar. Canada, I guess, for those of you that aren't familiar with the country as well. Uh, the University of British Columbia. Then we're going to go and speak to the MSFM program, where Deb and Ken will both be speaking about that. We're going to give you some feedback from the people that have gone through the program, offer some information about how to apply, tuition costs, funding opportunities, and then we'll get to the questions and answers. Next slide, please. So I guess this is uh, my turn to step in, uh, Harry. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Ken Byrne. Um, I'm a registered professional forester. Uh, I have uh, experience uh, in research, uh, modeling natural disturbances, and also uh, harvesting productivity, um, that sort of thing. Um, I'm fairly new to the program this year as a lecturer and coordinator, but I was uh, actually born and raised in Vancouver, so perhaps that's why I was chosen to uh, do this part of the uh, presentation. Uh, Vancouver is consistently ranked among uh, one of the most livable cities in the world uh, within the actual city of Vancouver. Uh, there's just over 600,000 people, but the greater Vancouver area, including all the cities around it, um, it's around 2.5 million. 
So the UBC campus is approximately 20 minutes driving from uh, downtown Vancouver. There's also uh, many bus routes that will serve uh, that, that commute as well. And it's only 35 minutes. And honestly, given the traffic and uh, parking in Vancouver, uh, that's a preferable option. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, UBC is uh, uh, a global center for research and teaching. Uh, I'm a graduate of uh, UBC myself. I did both my uh, graduate degrees here. It's uh, consistently ranked among uh, one of the top 20 public universities in the world. Uh, what you're looking at there is the main library. Uh, it's one of 11 libraries in on campus, and there's also access to libraries globally. Um, by the numbers, there's uh, just over uh, 66,000 students. Uh, of that, um, almost 56,000 are on the Vancouver campus. Next slide, please. So, um, as uh, as mentioned, uh, uh, UBC uh, UBC is ranked among the top universities. Uh, forestry specifically is. Uh, among one of the top three forestry schools in the world. Uh, we have over uh, 1,500 students, of which uh, 300 are uh, graduate students. And um, this is just a look at the uh, Forest Sciences Center. Uh, this is where the classes are held. Uh, there's a lot of collaborative space. Uh, the classroom is a dedicated classroom for the Masters uh, of Sustainable Forest Management students. Uh, there's also a number of uh, meeting rooms uh, that are available to book for smaller group meetings. And, uh, and, and this, is, this is the area where we are located here. Next slide, please. Okay, I think this is where I jump in. Uh, my name is Deb DeLong. I, am, I have been the coordinator and lecturer for the MSFM program for the last almost 10 years, but um, I'm winding down that role and Ken is taking it over. Um, what we're gonna do now is dive into a little bit more detail about the MSFM uh, Master of Sustainable Forest Management program. <clears throat> Program is very compact and it only runs over a 10 month period from July to, um, to April. It says July, but really actually it's even a little bit more condensed as we, you don't have to be in at the campus until the middle of August. So what we're gonna go, what we're gonna do now is go through a few slides to for you to think about whether or not this program is right for you. So we'll describe a bit about the program. And then if you've got any more specific questions that we cover here, you can put them in the chat. So this program was designed for naturally inquisitive people who enjoy working outdoors. That's key, enjoy working outdoors. As you'll see in some of the slides, we're outdoors quite a bit and especially when you get your first job after doing the program, more than likely you would be outside doing working. So <clears throat> professional forest land managers are essential for healthy, sustainable, product productive forests, of course, on which we depend. Um, and this program is accredited and uses the principles of sustainable forest land management to produce graduates that we hope are equipped to fulfill this need. And this need is constantly changing uh, the details of it and we are we pride ourselves in remaining quite nimble to um, make sure you get the right kind of education during the program as mentioned uh, it's accredited it's accredited by both the canadian forestry accreditation board or is known as cfab and also the society of american foresters and this is it's the only program in Canada that is uh, accredited by the Society of American Foresters. So now let's look a little bit into the curriculum <clears throat> and see what you're going to be learning, what you would be learning. 
So it's, it's a mix of theory and hands-on experiences. We really do try to spend as much time as we can in the field. So <clears throat> the program prepares you to design and implement site level and landscape level plans that integrate environmental, social, and economic components of sustainability. So this prepares you for careers in government, industry, and consulting companies. And graduates from the 2018 year um, were all, in fact, I would say 2019 as well as 2020, if they wanted a position in forestry, they were, they do have those positions. So, you know, essentially we can say it's a hundred percent employment rate. Here's a list of some of the courses that you would be taking. You can see it's divided into two categories, core courses and then electives. The core courses, they're not specific to subjects, but they're more integrated. So you see fundamentals, the first course, the second course, land information acquisition and analysis, and then site level forest management and landscape level forest management. So each of those courses has several modules within it that you would learn different things. <clears throat> and then the electives, economics and forest policy. There are only electives if you haven't taken such courses in the past. And then you have two courses left to, uh, to choose from after that. So as I already mentioned, we spend time in the field and in the classroom. And when we're in the field, in particular, we like to, we, 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 we talk to a lot of practicing foresters um, and other professionals in the natural resource management world and uh, in the and practitioners as well from um, many different backgrounds in addition to the for, professional forestry. As Ken already mentioned, some of the faculty of forestry is world renowned and you're gonna be learning from the best <laughs> and leading, leading edge expertise in the area of sustainable forest management. And the coursework includes hands-on field work with a real world experience. We do some of our uh, large, capstone courses with actual real clients, forest companies, community forests, and First Nations, and things like that. So this is probably key to a few of you attending the session that once you complete this, pro well, actually during the program, you can sign up to become a forester in training and you can count this time in the program toward your articling period of 24 months. So you can collect nine months of articling time towards your registered professional designation. Now this is probably some of the best marketing we could do is check out what our alumni are saying about the program. Now this is Mark. Tallman, and you can just read this through. But one of the the key, one of the interesting th things he points out here for him was uh, that he his classmates came from wildly different backgrounds, from data wizards and academics to hardly to hardy <laughs> wildland firefighters and everything in between. I think that really resonated with him is the the diversity of the cohort. And this is uh, a quote from Celine. She is now a, a forester up in the Yukon. And <clears throat> she kind of indicates how uh, intense the program is, but sort of uh, <clears throat> taking part in field work and conferences around the province for great networking opportunities was something that resonated uh, with her. And Brooke McKenzie, she's an RPF now 
she worked for forest industry in the interior and now she is working for the provincial government in I think a stewardship forester role. So she's sort of branching out in who she works for and gaining more and more responsibility. Again, she points out the fast paced and engaging aspects of the program. And now she's out there um, going to conferences and things and she's recognizing people she met during the program. Um, as we take people to take students to conferences and have them meet as many practicing foresters as possible for uh, increasing their networking opportunities. And finally, Isabel Allen, she's a, now an RPF as well. I think she graduated in 2015 or 16 and she is in Ontario. So not everyone stays in British Columbia. They do some people, uh, well, as the previous one, Celine, she's in the Yukon, Isabel's in, the, in Ontario. And we also have people who are, go back to where they came from all over the world. We, we have people that, alumni in New Zealand, alumni in the UK, the, the US and um, Kazakhstan actually. So is a, uh, what resonated with Isabel is, I think the, some of the peer to peer learning that she had, like her class, she really enjoyed meeting her classmates and learning from them, as well as uh, the instructors and professors. And I will add my welcome now with my section about um, program requirements and how to apply. And my name is Julie Mori, and I'm the admissions coordinator for the program. And I'm very thankful that you guys all took the time to join us today. And I know that the application um, process can seem complex, so hopefully I can demystify that for you and reassure you that we are here to help you in all the way through. And um, next slide, please. So the program requirements, so this is sort of the base um, um, requirements coming in is that uh, you have an academic background in relevant fields such as biology, ecology, and other environmental sciences, and also um, basic stats course, microeconomics, and ecology. And you'll find in the application itself, there'll be an opportunity for you to um, check off some of those boxes. But it would also like to um, remind you that this is a professional program. And so um, that considers your professional background, academic background, and it looks at the breadth of your experience, so both academic and professional. And both Ken and Deb and Harry can speak more fully into those considerations um, as they will be the ones who are reviewing your final applications and suitability for the program. Next slide. So there are minimum academic requirements and we are under the umbrella of the UBC Faculty of Graduate Studies. So these requirements are actually based for any grad student that is coming into UBC. And with a couple notations that forestry um, has some specific requirements, but I'll address those in just a moment. So as you'll see, um, you need a bachelor degree coming in. There are some three-year bachelor degrees that are approved, but that is for um, more international students where a three year is standard. But you'll see links there and don't worry about copying those down now. I will include those in our Q&A so that you can just bookmark them and refer to them at that time. And I do want to draw your attention to the B plus range uh, minimum coming in is that we do not convert your grades um, to the UBC GPA scale. So what we use is your actual transcript from your institution. So that means that if your GPA at your particular institution reach, is in the B plus range, this is your senior level credits, then you would meet the general admission requirements. And for international students, other than anyone from the US um, institutions, your GPA is calculated on the whole transcript. So that's meaning that it's not just the senior level courses. Um, and again, 
the range of information covering minimum academic requirements is multifaceted. So I highly recommend that you bookmark these links, which I will provide later, and you can read through the Q&A um, and frequently asked questions about GPA calculations. So and next slide. So applications from universities outside of Canada and the US in which English is not the primary language um, must provide an English language profici proficiency test. And um, this is where we differ from UBC grad study requirements is that forestry has a higher English language profic proficiency requirement. Um, and that's an example um, for ILETs. Forestry is a band score of seven, whereas you'll see on the grad study site, it's a band score of six. And for TOEFL, the forestry requirement is 100, whereas grad studies is slated at a 90. So um, another important thing to note is that you are exempt from English language requirements if you completed your degree credential in a non-English speaking country, but your university primary language of instruction was English. And usually this is stated on the transcript so that would um, we would could see clearly that you wouldn't require the language requirement. But if it is not clear, then we will request an official letter um, from the university registrar that you would provide that signed saying that the primary mode of instruction was English. So now on to how to apply. So this is a little bit of the nitty gritty. And so I'm going to go through each of the five points. I'll try not to take too much time on this, but um, I'll go through one at a time and just point out some highlights. Um, so number one, uh, complete the online application and pay the application fee. So it is important to note that this fee is non-refundable, but the fee is waived um, in the following circumstances that if you have citizenship or an address in one of the world's 50 least populated countries, um, or least developed countries, sorry, um, as declared by the United Nations, then you're exempt. And so I will also include that link. It's part of the Faculty of Grad Studies link, so you can refer um, and see if you're exempt. Number two is providing scanned copies of official transcripts for all post-secondary educations that you've attended. So this is unique because it includes everything. So even if you took one course at a college and you never finished it, we still require the official transcript from that institution. And it's included in your list of academic um, institutions that you attended. And also if you took a transfer credit and on your main conferral transcript, you, it's listed there as your uh, an official um, transfer credit, we still require the um, official transcript from that institution as well, even though it's listed on your second institution. And one very important thing to note is that uh, we do require a PDF of the official transcript. A screenshot is not acceptable. Um, a record of your grades that you print off from your institution is not official. And you need to remember to include the grading key, which is found on the back of your transcript. Because if you don't, it seems like an easy thing to overlook. But if you don't include it, it's actually considered incomplete and we will not accept it. Um, so please ensure that you copy both sides of your official transcript. And one more piece on this is that um, many institutions now offer official electronic copies. If you receive one of those, please unlock it, print it to PDF and upload the PDF because if you um, upload your locked PDF, we can't print it or open it. So please ensure you unlock it and just print, uh, print it off as a PDF. So number three, this is important list of referees, minimum one academic referee is required. Um, please remember to use official um, institutional emails for your referees. You can't use Gmail, Hotmail, Yahoo, or other ones um, because our eVision application system will actually refuse it if it has any of those um, suffixes. So. Um, ensure that it's their institutional email addresses, and then you can be assured that they're going to go through. And I do realize that, and we get this question often, is that many of you are mature students who've been in the profession and in your careers for many years, and sometimes it's really difficult to find an academic reference, and it can be challenging. So unfortunately, we must have an academic reference. So in order to 
bridge that gap. You know, this can include instructors from your professional training, from courses, or any continuing education that you've taken. Um, and there's also helpful hints on our grad studies FAQ in the references tab about how to obtain references if you have been um, not in academia for a while. And number four, send in your official language proficiency test result if applicable. Um, we've already discussed considerations for English language requirements. Um, the most common is IELTS and TOEFL. And Grad Studies does list all the acceptable institutions on their website, and I'll include that link later on. But please note, um, almost all testing institutions have now adapted to COVID considerations. And so that means there's no longer any exemptions or extensions, extensions on deadlines uh, due to COVID. So um, we still expect that you are able to provide your tests within the appropriate time frame and the closing dates of our application. And number five, submit your MSFM letter of intent, questionnaire and curriculum, uh, your CV. And this is pretty self-explanatory and there are no hard or fast rules or regulations, um, but just a reminder that this is really the section of your application where you can shine. Um, it'll show your personality, your experiences, your interests, so put your best foot forward and take your time in completing that section. Um, so I will be posting, uh, putting all the links in for how to apply um, FAQs. And just to note that our deadline is March 15th for the July intake. And a reminder that um, although we are on a rolling basis, even though you apply now, you may not have you may not hear till after um, the March deadline. So um, we encourage you to apply early, but just note that you may not hear until after the closing deadline on final results. Tuition and funding. So um, this section is, it is a professional master's program. So you'll note that tuition is higher and also higher for international students. And many people have sent us questions saying, why is tuition so high, particularly high for international students? And the reason for that is that UBC is a publicly funded university. And so approximately 45% of funding comes from the government, a portion of which is comes from our Canadian taxes. And so that is why there is also a difference in the price. Um, and you'll see that, uh, we always split tuition into three installments. And because the program technically runs from, you know, on your admit letter, it would show as July. So July, September, and January is when tuition installments are due. And we also require a $1,000 non-refundable acceptance deposit at the time of accepting your offer. And this is credited to your account. So you get that money back um, on your first tuition installment in July. And tuition and funding regarding scholarships. Um, many of you have asked about scholarships and what funding is available for your studies. And um, because it's a professional program, uh, the options for um, merit-based opportunities are quite limited. It's usually our research programs that where this is the focus. But what we do have is clearly outlined on our website. And I will link that as well later on. Um, this includes links to our UBC bursary program, and that's needs-based funding. So I do encourage you to visit those sites. And I would like to say that note that we are here to assist you um, every step of the way in the application process. And if for any reason you're uncomfortable with asking questions within the chat box, you can always contact me through our email address. And I will answer any questions via email. We can even set up a phone or Zoom. We're always happy to help. So I guess we'll be going now to the Q&A section. Thanks. Thank you, Julie. So, oh, sorry, go ahead here. I think, can, can, let me, I'll just, I'm gonna hand it over to you immediately, but the one thing that I guess we'd like you to think about um, as you're looking at this and thinking whether this program is the right fit for you, there are other professional masters programs as well in the Faculty of Forestry. And Julie will be providing uh, links and information for that if this doesn't feel like it quite fits with what your interests are. And with that, Ken, I happily turn it over to you. Thanks, Harry. Uh, so um, 
there are a few uh, questions that have already been posed in the uh, uh, question chat box. So maybe I'll start with uh, uh, some of those. We have um, one from uh, Gerv. Uh, I don't have the full name, Gervin. Uh, Gervin. Uh, hello, thanks for this webinar. I have a question. I'm from India, completed a PhD in forestry and, uh, in, and climate change. And uh, so the question is, are you eligible? Um, I would say certainly, um, uh, certainly you're eligible. Uh, I don't know if you have a follow-up question to that. Um, I see that Julie has posted the, uh, some of the admission FAQs. Um, so I don't know if you have a, an additional follow-up question to that, Gervin, but I'm more than happy to entertain that. Okay. Um, there's another question. I uh, completed four degrees, uh, bachelor programs in agriculture, MSc in agroforestry. Uh, agro um, no gaps between educational professional experience uh, by and uh, again, I, I would say definitely def definitely eligible. Uh, yep. And uh, so then there's uh, also some questions. Um, that were sent in advance of this presentation. So uh, maybe I'll start at the top. Uh, does the MSFM courses help me qualify for an RPF under ABCFP? Yes, definitely. Um, maybe I'll address some of the questions that um, uh, that are more directed towards me. I think there's some admissions related questions and I'll let uh, Julie follow up on some of those. And, and Deb or Harry, please uh, feel free to uh, chime in if you have anything to add. Um, regarding uh, careers, what kind of career opportunities are available to MSFM graduates? Uh, Deb kind of illustrated that through a couple of examples. Um, typically, you would start, it, it, gives you, it gives you your entry into the profession. And uh, usually after the program, many of our graduates find uh, positions, uh, field positions, uh, in, in which to start from. And, uh, you know, from that, uh, you can, uh, go any direction you want in, in forestry. You could, uh, specialize in, in silviculture. You could specialize in policy, uh, forest operations. Um, it typically, typical employers might be, uh, consultants, uh, licensees, um, uh, even the provincial government, uh, we have um, all of those actually regularly coming to us uh, to present to our current students and uh, provide, you know, uh, at least a, a scope or a perspective of the kind of employment opportunities that are available to them. So, um, uh, you know, they, and, then, and then from there, as you gain more experience, uh, it is, the program is intended to give you that um, foundational knowledge that will prepare you for um, moving into management positions if you prefer to do that. Um, some people might do that and then come back and they prefer being out in the field. I mean, uh, at that point in your career, um, anything goes. Uh, Harry or Deb, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. I would I would say that um, the employers are getting a little more diverse as well. Like it also includes NGOs and um, things like that, municipalities. You know, that's actually a big one. The urban, sometimes they like to hire registered or foresters in, in training for urban interface jobs. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of a lot more diversity of employers now as opposed to maybe 10, 15 years ago. Okay. And let um, me, it's Harry. Just 
Ken and Deb, I'll echo what you both have said. But I think I want to emphasize, because these are some of the questions here, this really is about equipping you to go out and work with people and go work on the land. And kind of from that perspective, it's not an academic or kind of a research-based kind of degree. And then I just very quickly, um, Kira had a question in the Q&A. And I think Deb can perhaps speak to this as well, but Kira, but yes, we've had a lot of people that have actually had extensive um, fire experience that um, have come to go through the program to get their RPF designation. So yes, I think you'd be a good fit for sure on that basis. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, Deb. Yeah. So um, maybe I'll just go down to down the list, maybe on the career uh, theme while we're on it. Do you feel that every course was relevant to career endeavors? Uh, is the degree equivalent to a thesis based master's in academia uh, for future uh, PhD acceptance and or the workforce? So uh, the course has is accredited with the um, Canadian Forestry Accreditation Board and uh, the Society of American Foresters. And uh, the curriculum is regularly reviewed um, by those two uh, licensing organizations to become a professional forester. So the content of the courses um, to answer the first part of that question is that uh, yes, the courses are relevant uh, to career endeavors, specifically careers as a professional forester. Um, it, they're designed to meet uh, the competencies expected by a professional forester, um, so definitely applicable. The second part of the question is the degree equivalent to a thesis-based master's in academia. And um, no, it's, it's a course-based master's. Um, Typically, uh, a research-based or thesis-based masters uh, may center on a specific topic, which wouldn't include necessarily. It might include part of some of those competencies, uh, but not all of them. Uh, but the focus in the uh, thesis-based masters is research, and it is a stream that is more tailored to going on to uh, become uh, to do a PhD or maybe go into um, research specifically. Um, many thesis-based masters do go into the workforce as well as PhD um, um, uh, degrees. They do go into the workforce as well, but maybe as, as specialists um, in a particular area, whereas this course is designed to train um, more uh, generalist uh, professional foresters. That's not to say that it completely excludes you from, you know, a subsequent degree. Uh, if you have, uh, you know, an interest and a, um, a certain talent towards towards research, I mean, it is not unheard of. We've had students in the past who have gone on to do their PhD, but it is the exception rather than the rule. I don't know if uh, Harry, uh, Deb, Julie, if, and particularly Julie, has more insight into the um, into the uh, prerequisites to some of those uh, research programs. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So yeah, just to reiterate that that um, there is no direct laddering from a professional master's program into a thesis based program, and also um, there's a whole different set of requirements. Like um, you have to secure a supervisor before you can um, even apply to. A research-based program, either um, another master's, MSc, MASc, or going into a PhD. So, like Ken said, mm -hmm. it, it has happened in the past, but it is the exception rather than the rule. And I'll also take this time to quickly um, clarify because there was one question that came in about: Is it possible to begin in 2024? So the answer is no. We don't do pre-intakes; it's per academic year. And also to reiterate that um, during COVID, we did make some exceptions and we offered deferrals, but that is no longer the case. Um, prior to COVID, no deferrals were offered. During COVID, there were exceptions made. So going into this year, um, you know, we'll see how, how everything goes with COVID, but at this point, um, deferrals will not be offered for this next year. 
Okay, thanks, thanks, Julie. Um, so there's a few questions that have uh, more of a theme around environmental big picture. Um, this, uh, the MSFM program is, um, although it, it, it trains you to be a professional forester in both Canada and the US, um, certainly those skills are transferable uh, to be a professional forester in other jurisdictions. However, there's a few questions here um, related to, um, you know, developing countries specifically as foresters and environmentalists, what are you doing to manage env environment more sustainably in developing countries? Uh, I mean, we really don't have the jurisdiction to do so uh, from this uh, vantage point. Um, although we do have students who have come from uh, developing countries to bring those skills back and integrate that with their uh, local knowledge about uh, you know policy, uh, you know regulatory requirements, uh, and and that sort of thing. Uh, but we don't uh, directly uh, engage in you know managing uh, you know sustainably in, in uh, other countries uh, such as you know uh, Ghana, for example. Um, what is the current state of the global forest? Well, I'd have to I'd have to look that up a little bit, but I know that um, the global forest is under pressure in uh, many jurisdictions around the world, uh, both tropical, temperate, um, and uh, and boreal. Uh, all forests are under pressure, so it requires uh, people who are trained to go into those forests, ask the appropriate questions, and um, have a a structure to be able to manage them. And uh, so, from that standpoint, um, you know, uh, we are we are uh, training in those skills, and it's a matter of how they are integrated with uh, other pieces of knowledge. Uh, Harry, you might have something more to add to that. Yep, I will, Ken. Um, and Tony, I see you have your hand up, so I'll ask you your question next. Again, as I mentioned earlier, we do have other professional master's programs at, in the Faculty of Forestry. There's a master's in international forestry. There's a master's in urban forestry as well. So again, it's looking for what best fits with your interests and your objectives. I would suggest to you that um, there are these general competencies and skills that you can kind of acquire that are applicable in all these other settings but you may get additional material content um, in those programs that are more tailored to that international setting or that urban forestry setting. Uh, what I would offer is from my perspective, BC is both huge, unique, and a fascinating place to do forestry that I think um, more generally you can carry these skills um, learn so much i think that kind of can help put you on the leading edge of some of the challenges we face with forestry um probably more so because we're coming from this kind of uh, western tradition um more directly applicable to north america perhaps to europe but i've seen students leave the program that um go work in south america as well so uh, i would encourage you um, there's in some ways a host of different regions and in some ways nearly different countries within BC if you do come here. Yeah, and maybe to add to that too, the, the forests that we have here in North America are mirrored in other continents in, in Northern Europe. Uh, you know, even, even New Zealand, I've traveled to New Zealand and in parts of the South Island, for example, it, you know, some of the pictures I've taken look exactly like BC. So uh, I think there is a common uh, camaraderie among foresters across, uh, across the globe. Okay. Um, next question is, um, how do we measure sustainable management? And how, oh, how can forests be managed sustainably on private land? I mean, my contention is that they would, could be managed sustainably on private land the way, same way they could be um, sustainably managed on, on public land. I mean, the principles of um, 
sustainability are the same. And uh, I think the, the better question or the bigger question is, uh, what are you trying to sustain? And, um, and these are the types of uh, discussions and questions that uh, we go into in, in the uh, program through uh, core coursework and also uh, guest speakers. And, um, and I think that, that uh, that's the primary focus there, whether you're uh, leaving this program to manage um, you know, forests on public land or private land, um, you're equally well equipped. Uh, we had a field trip, uh, even this most recent, uh, in this most recent cohort where uh, we actually went to view uh, harvesting operations on uh, private land. And um, having been on both, it, it, they, look, they look very much the same. And it really depends on what your objectives are when you uh, start talking about sustainability. I don't know if anybody else wants to chime in on that. Okay, moving down the list. Um, uh, I'm just checking the chat box as I go here to make sure that I'm not missing any questions. Uh, feel free to alert me if, uh, if I have. Um, okay, we'll maybe uh, dive into the curriculum a little bit. Um, you know, what are the weekly after class time requirements? Uh, as Deb mentioned in her presentation, it is an in, uh, intense program. Uh, you work in a small cohort, uh, which is, uh, I think, really good for um, uh, learning. You get to know your classmates really well. Uh, you'll learn a lot from them. You'll learn a lot about um, relationship building as well. These are some of the softer skills that you will get out of the program, um, working under pressure in teams. So they're to answer the question about after class time requirements, there, there will be uh, you know, significant after class time requirements. Um, it is a short program, but it is an intense program. Um, I don't know if uh, hopefully that uh, answers that fully. I don't know if uh, uh, Deb or Harry would like to add anything to that. Okay, M moving, moving on then. Um, are there any overlap? Is there any overlap or exploration into silviculture or mycology? Um, so silviculture, certainly that's a core uh, element to being a professional forester. Um, and uh, the program is, is quite heavy with um, uh, silviculture related topics. Coming from, you know, uh, I've, I've trained as a, as a graduate student, um, you know, in, in the silviculture area, uh, I've also transferred some of that knowledge to working with an organization in forest operations. And uh, one of uh, the contentions is that actually a good silviculture plan is in fact a, a good harvesting plan. So it does it, you know, encompass uh, both forest operations and uh, you know, core silviculture topics. So uh, certainly there's a, you know extensive look at uh, silviculture uh, mycology, uh, now correct me if I'm, uh, you know, misinterpreting this, but mycology might be more uh, the specific um, detailed investigation into uh, fungi. We do have um, uh, elements of the program exploring uh, pathology. Uh, it is more specific to the types of fungi that are a, an issue in forest management, and it is not inclusive of all uh, fungi. Uh, so it does, uh, where, uh, where mycology or mycology related topics come in, it would be uh, related to uh, specific uh, issues around management in, in, in forests. I, I would add to that just quickly that if, if a particular student is very interested in something specific, there is room to do a directed study, which you could delve into that topic area of mycology in much more detail if you choose to do so. Yes, and we have, um, you know, great faculty. I know the, the um, professor who comes in to uh, work with the students on the pathology part of the program is extremely passionate and extremely energetic about all things fungi. So 
if, if that is an interest of yours, um, there is the capacity to accommodate that. Uh, if I enroll in this, am I allowed to register in other courses? Yes, certainly. And you know, further to uh, Deb's point, as well as directed studies, there's um, other courses in um, forest operations, forest health, entomology. Uh, there's a number of options that you can you can explore uh, that are available through the Faculty of Forestry. And uh, another question I have here is what is the major difference between this program and the graduate certificate in forest management and conservation? Um, I, I mean, one of the key differences I think is that the certificate does not qualify you to become an RPF. So uh, it is a shorter in duration and, uh, and I haven't looked into that uh, certificate in detail but um, my impression is that it is uh, designed for um, you know, professionals who are maybe already in the field and want to, uh, I guess, supplement their, their knowledge in some of those areas. And I see Julie has come on and probably has uh, more to add than I can offer. So I'm the admissions coordinator for the certificate program as well. And so it's definitely a, a program. So everything is online. There's no um, in-person sessions and it is very focused on people who are um, in the profession but can only take one course have time to take one course per semester you do have the option of um, doing two or more but most people just uh, take one and so it's a way over two, a two-year period of time as you can get an official uh, certificate but it does not equal a, um, a, a degree or directly ladder into the degree programs but having said that, it would be great on your uh, CV and your academic history if you do choose to apply um, to some of the other programs later on. And I have included the link, so you can visit that. And just to let you know that applications, if you are interested in taking a course through there, um, applications close on December the 1st. Okay, thanks. And, yeah. I think it's just, again, a useful reminder for everybody that one of the things that is we believe a strength of this MSFM program is there is a lot of, um, we take you out in the field a lot, given that that's where the expectation is, you'll likely be working. Um, that's part of the course design. And so that's something that you just can't get from purely having the online course. So again, something to keep in mind if you're trying to figure out what it is that you want and which program best fits with you. No, thanks for that, Harry. And that's a that's a great segue into another question I see here, uh, specifically uh, as the program is course based. Have there been considerations for moving to an online option hybrid model? Um, there are very few credit programs for forestry in Canada. Online access would likely increase interest, and yes, it may increase applications. But um, as as Harry alluded to uh you know the real strength of this program is the amount of time that we do spend out in the field um there is only so much you can get from uh theory in a classroom or through a presentation or online um the kind of engagement that is offered in this program uh you know as a as a professional forester myself is is necessary for some of those concepts to really uh, sink in and become part of you. Uh, so we, we do uh, focus and, and place a lot of value in, in spending time out in the forest, um, speaking with professionals, and uh, there's, there's just something uh, more to it when you are out there and you see th things in three dimensions. And, and you feel the kind of influences that are, that are influencing for us that you can't get from a lecture and you can't get it from online. And, um, and I think that you know, one of the things that uh, employers like about the graduates that come out of this program is that they have had that experience in the field and specific, specifically had that experience in the field working with other people because that is forestry and, um, and you need to, uh, I guess demonstrate that skill set. 
in order to be, um, you know, a, a productive um, forester in the industry. And, you know, I'm sure, uh, you know, Deb has been working with this program for a number of years. And, um, you know, we had, uh, you know, an exception last year where we did do more of a hybrid model, but uh, because of COVID, but even, even within the context of COVID, um, we still uh, incorporated that field component. And let me just sort of add again, something for if you're considering this, I think I misspoke a bit earlier when I was trying to describe, I guess, the um, relevance of the program elsewhere around the world. I think Ken put it very well. Because of the diversity of forests that we have here, you can sort of carry that knowledge around the world where there's temperate forests and boreal forests. I think the other thing that Ken spoke to there is we also, because of the size of BC, we have these diversity of kind of interests and in different ways that people are exploring how you manage forests and what for. We have First Nations that are increasingly playing a greater role. And we've had graduates that go work for First Nations. We have Community Forests, a program that's been around for 20 years and continues to grow. Again, smaller scale kind of um, organizations with a range of values, depending where you find yourself across the province. You know, we have basically global um, companies ranked globally um, in the top 10 that are based out of BC. Um, we have consultants, we have um, people who work for government. So there's a whole range of possibilities um, where this degree could take you. And you know, this gives you a way to explore those opportunities when you're in the program as well too. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, Harry. Um, so I think there's, uh, does the program focus on practical application of skills? Uh, for example, the work as a, of a forester or this course work more theory-based? And uh, I think I, in, at least in part, answered that with um, my, my previous description. It's, it's definitely focused on, on practical application of skills. I mean, um, I, I would say some of the, you know, some of the most valuable things I've learned in forestry have been learned out in the forest and in, in, uh, as a complement to some of that theory. Um, you need the theory, uh, but uh, without the practical application of that theory, it's, um, it's very hard to uh, practice uh, forestry. So that's uh, a really important um, element that uh, I think is important in this program. There's a few, um, uh, I mean, that, that covers a lot of the questions that I've seen here uh, on the curriculum, uh, some of the big picture. Um, thank you, Harry, for you know, uh, adding in that diversity factor. I mean, British Columbia is the most diverse province in Canada. Uh, there, we have uh, 14 uh, forested ecosystems that are very unique in nature. And, um, you know, many of them are, there's many parallels of those, um, you know, uh, across, uh, across the globe, really. I mean, from uh, mild, uh, wet, temperate rainforest to uh, dry interior, almost uh, desert ecosystems to alpine uh, forests to northern uh, boreal forests and, and uh, uh, willows, grasslands. So, um, you know, within, you know, a few hours driving to Vancouver there, you can, uh, go through multiple ecosystems and, um, there's multiple opportunities to get involved in, um, especially through the, uh, the landscape uh, management plans that, uh, we do as part of our capstone course in the, the in the second term, uh, you'll certainly have, uh, plenty of exposure to that. Maybe I'll go to, um, and again, oh, sorry, Harry, go ahead, Harry. And again, for those of you joining us, depending on where you're, um, you may have been paying attention, but there's very much, um, BC has been in the news. Um, 
we're going through a series of probably policy changes here in British Columbia, which I think, again, is going to both create opportunity and um, we, uh, you know, would encourage you to look at that as a, um, we just seem to note that we're starting to lose people here. So I think we'll try and wrap it up in the next minute or two. But again, in a larger context, um, it's we're going to be in a process of change here. And then things like landscape plans that Ken have talked about, there is going to be a need for people with that expertise and training in it. So once again, an opportune time to look at a program like this, if that's your interest. Maybe some of the, um, maybe we'll move to some of the um, more, I guess, uh, uh, functional uh, questions related to admissions, uh, scholarships. Um, are there any scholarship opportunities available? Uh, what about scholarships for international students? Um, Julie is a good one to answer that. <laughs> um, so I know that we're a bit over time here. So um, a lot of that was already covered within our discussion. If you have more questions, um, we have posted the links you can visit there. But as I said before, um, for professional master's programs, the scholarships that are available are for already um, accepted students. So it's once you're in the program and then it's uh, based from there. So there are no entrance scholarships per se. And also I will point out now so that it's, um, and it's on our website as well, but uh, MasterCard Foundation um, is no longer accepting applications. And so the MasterCard program will not be offered for this intake here. So just um, so you're aware of that as well. So I think, you know, just to wrap things up, as Julie pointed out, we're a bit over time. Thank you very much for all your questions. If we haven't addressed it, please feel free to email us um, and we'll answer them. And we look forward to hearing back from you if this is something that um, you're excited about and you see it as a where your future might start. So thanks very much. Anybody else would like that? No, thank you, Harry. Great. Thanks for joining thank us. Thank you all. Yep. Thank you, everybody.